Hey, welcome back, everybody. Uh, this is your host, Rod Courtney, uh, doing another episode of Tailgate Topics. And today we have back our good friend, Jesse Hardy. Uh, he's been with us a few times on this podcast. Uh, and this week's or this month's topic is about alcohol and drugs on the job site. So welcome, everybody. And Jesse, how you doing, man? It's great to be here. I, I feel great. I'm glad to be back and talking about this topic because it is so, so prevalent today. Drug and alcohol abuse, especially on the job site. Yeah, it is, man. And I've, you know, I've read this article uh, a few times and I've actually used some of this information in some of our um, all hand safety meetings and things that we do with our company. So very well written. Um so in, in the article, again, we're going to talk about, uh, you know, out, drug and alcohol in the workplace uh, and on your job sites. Uh, and in the article, Jesse, you you started off with a story about, you know, uh, some people had to call 911. Tell us about that. What, what happened that day, man? Man, that is actually a true story. So I was, uh, was just out of, I spent about a decade building pipelines and oil and gas facilities out project to project, just like everybody does. And I, this was my first corporate job. So I took a corporate job and one day, it was a fine spring day, got a call from a project manager in Colorado. Hey, Jess, we just found somebody in the Port of John and they're dead. They got a bottle of Percocet at their feet. And what do we do? And they had already called 911. So I, I said, look, I'll head out there. And it was just that. It was my first time, I think, that we ever had it. I had ever seen an OD on a job site. Now, oil and gas is a lot like linemen. Uh, the oil and gas folks are a lot like linemen. They, they live some hard lives. They make a lot of money. They work a lot of hours and they live some hard lives. But I'd never seen anybody OD on the job site. So that's kind of where we started off there. And uh, it really brought up to my the thoughts that, man, this is an epidemic and this isn't a, they have a problem. It's a, it's a, we, we have a problem sort of problem. And it got me thinking about it. It absolutely is. And, uh, you know, in our, our pre-recording before we started this, uh, you know, we were all talking about um, the, the topic shortly. And uh, like I mentioned to you guys, you know, this one is, is very personal for me. Um, I, from my, my biological father, my stepfather, my, my brother, uh, my ex-wife, uh, I have friends, um, you know, between alcohol and opi opioids, um, it's, it's, you know, I mean, they call it an epidemic, right? An opioid mm -hmm. epidemic. And, and it really, it really is, you know, there was a time I can remember, um, you know, early 2000s when my ex-wife could go to four different doctors in the same day and get yeah. a month's a month's worth of you know Vicodin uh, each time and yeah. you know now now there's a system in place that's supposed to stop all that you know just like everything else though everything evolves and when something evolves you know the the uh, people around it evolve with it and they find ways to skirt the system uh, so it hasn't stopped the epidemic with opioids, but um, maybe it's helped. Um, I know, like you, Jesse, I've seen it uh, in the workplace. Um, you know, I, I have a, a law enforcement background and uh, have, have seen it there as well. So, um, so the, in in your article, the the next section, you know, you you know, you, we, we we just talked about the incident that occurred on your job site there, and and that. It's not that they have a problem, which I mean, they do. Let, let's be honest. Yeah. But, you know, right. they're, they're they're on our workplace. They're they're, they're part of, you know, we, we, we call them family most of the time because we all work together. It's not that they have a problem. It's we have a problem. And then so how how in, you know, the next part of your, your article, you talk about how drugs affect the workplace. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, now these statistics, they probably need to be updated because this article, this was written about five years ago, but man, the National Drug-Free Workplace Alliance, they, they put out a statistic that about 11.6% of workers have an illicit drug problem. Mm 
and 16% have a heavy or heavy alcohol users. That's a big one. The National Safety Council reported that, that about 25% of the people indicated that they uh, have taken part in binge drinking in the past month, not the past year, the past month, one in four. And, and probably the, the most staggering, the staggering statistic is that they estimate that there's about 15 million illegal drug users, uh, those who abuse drugs, illegal drugs or alcohol. And about 70 percent of those 15 million people are employed. So they're out there. And I still teach this on a day to day. I've been teaching this all week. That's where I've been traveling. We were talking before the show. One of the topics I'm teaching is this right here. And uh, I teach it to all our supervisors. So, yeah, it affects us. It's out there and it affects us in a couple of different, uh, in a few different ways. Uh, so, you know, you, you might, it shows up in absenteeism. People don't show up to work. It, but even more, more uh, I think, risky is it shows up in presenteeism, meaning they show up to work, but they're not really fit for duty. And that, that doesn't necessarily mean they're drunk or high, but they're just not fit for duty mentally, physically. It's just it's affecting us there. Uh, they make poor decisions. Uh, it, there's a higher turnover rate because the people that are doing their job, these guys that, that are having the issues, they're not fit for duty. They're not necessarily pulling their weight. And the good guys are wanting to leave. And then yep. you're just having all kinds of issues with that. You know, I this is... Um... One that I've seen a lot, you know, like like you, Jesse, I I used to work on the road. I was out there months and months at a time. Um, and like you said, you know, these guys are making pretty good money. And uh, if they do get a day off um, and sometimes they don't even take a day off, it just takes an evening off. You know, they they go out and they they partake and, you know, it's usually alcohol. You know, I'm, I know sometimes it's it's more than that. But, you know, Jesse, what, what do you say to the guys that tell you this? You know what, Jesse? it's my life. It's legal. I'm not drinking on the job. How is my drinking outside of work affecting your project? You know, I would, I would probably acknowledge the fact that I, I would affirm and acknowledge the fact that you are right. This is legal and you have the right to do it on your own time. But I would bring it back to a personal level. Uh, because what he's talking about right there is he's saying, how is this affecting, how, how, how is this affecting the project? He's taking it more back to a legalistic kind of thing. And I would bring it back to the personal level of, let's call him Jim. Let's say I'm talking to Jim. Like, Jim, you know what? We've been, we've been together on projects for years now. And I've seen you. I love you. I appreciate you. You do great work. I care about you. And what I'm seeing is, is the fact that you're drinking more and more. And what I'm seeing is I, I see how it affects you at night because we, we live around the same place. We live in the same RV park. And I care about you. I care about you. I care about your family. I know what it's doing to your wife and kids. Now, I also know what it's doing to you at work. I know you're showing up late sometimes. I know that you're, you're coming through. And I know that you're not doing everything the way you used to, to the quality and level that you used to. And I think it's connected to that. But what it really comes back to, Jim, is my friend, you're not living up to your full potential. And I see this not getting better, but getting worse, because if you don't take some action, man, there is no way that this gets better without you taking action, because this is a degenerative issue. It's a chronic issue. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I think. Okay, so, you know, many years ago when I was in the Army, you got to understand I was, you know, 19, 20, 21, you know, uh, up to my late 20s. Um, And and when when you're younger like that, uh, you know, I I did, man, I would I would drive 45 minutes or an hour away. We would, you know, drink until one or two in the morning, come back and we back up at, you know, 430 or five to to get out on a run and do some some PT. and I, I can remember, man, um, you know, running, you know, down down the roads at Fort Stewart and having to stop at the side of the road and, you know, up chuck for a little bit and then catch back up. It, it was it was hard, um, but I did it because, I mean, I, I was young now, though, you know, I'm in my 50s, man. Um, if if I uh, 
you know, go to a crawfish boil. Um, and for those of you not from Louisiana, the, you know, those, they're not crayfish, they are crawfish. But anyway, um, you know, we, we do that or may, maybe it's a, a football game or whatever. And we tailgate. And, you know, I, I'm not intending to drink that much. But I mean, you know, I, I have a few and uh, my wife drives me home and I'm not even, you know, near as intoxicated as I was then or as some of these guys get now. I mean, I wake up the next day and I, I'm just not worth a darn. I'm hung over. And I, I don't think people take that into account. The, the physical ailments, no matter how young you are or, you know, how careful you try to be, when you come to work the next day and you've been intoxicated the night before, number one, you haven't got enough sleep. There's just, there's no way. There's no way you drank that much and, and, and you slept enough. So, so there's one thing. You're, you're more tired than the next guy. Um, you know, I, I used to ask this when, when I was a police officer, um, you know, we, we would teach classes and, and stuff like you do, Jesse, and would, okay, if someone shows up and, and they're, you know, they're, they're not legally drunk, okay, but they are pretty darn hungover, <clears throat> do you want that person to have your back that day? Is, is that the person you want uh, backing you up? Same thing on these job sites. It, do, do you want someone like that with, with a, a bad hangover to be your working partner, to be the one that, that has your back when it comes to safety? I, yeah. I would I would say no. Yeah, no. And it, it's even beyond having the back. It's being your blind spot mirror. Yeah. Because a lot of what we do is, is dangerous stuff and procedural type stuff. And we get wrapped around the axle. We're not perfect. And that guy next to you is supposed to be your brother. He's supposed to be your brother or sister that's keeping you yep. and looking out for you. Uh, and I'm here to tell you, no, that that's not it because the, you're not going to be recognized. In it. Yeah. Well, but going back to you, what you were saying with sleep there, um, you know, I still tell myself from time to time, hey, man, I'm just worn out. I need to have a couple of beers and go to sleep. It'll help me sleep. Science shows that that is not the case. Science shows that if you're drinking alcohol, consuming sugar, think about what it is. It is sugar. It goes into sugar. It gets in your system. It raises your body temperature and it keeps you from sleeping as well. You don't get as deep a sleep. Yep. So not only are you out wasting nighttime time, you're actually consuming things that are going to keep you from whatever little sleep you get from being quality sleep. Yes, absolutely. And okay, so let, let's say that I'm um, a supervisor, a foreman, superintendent, whatever on the job site. Um, can, can you go through maybe some signs and symptoms of things that I should, I, I maybe should look for in the employees to see, you know, maybe um, uh, to tell if, if maybe they're going through some of this? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, if, if I'm out there, I'm looking at folks that are taking longer breaks, maybe longer lunches, I'm looking for folks that have a, a pattern of safety incidents. Uh, and one of the newer statistics that I use in my class is, uh, and I think it's dealing with alcohol abuse. So alcohol abuse, those who abuse alcohol are 2.6 times more likely to have an incident. And I believe that's coming if I'm, I think that's coming from the National Safety Council last year or the year before. But you will have a pattern of safety incidents. I actually had that in a safety professional. He had a safe, he had a, a, a few safety incidents, motor vehicle type incidents. And come to find out, he also had an alcohol problem, you know, and, and we had to deal with that. Uh, so you're looking at taking long breaks and lunches, pattern of safety incidents. It might be, it, it might look like a, a history of medical claims too increased number of medical claims because going back to like you're saying with your ex-wife for me uh rod it was it was my mom she she got on the opioid cycle back in the late 1990s to early 2000s and then eventually they did cut her off and that was a whole another nightmare but they they file medical claims so that they can get their pills and the company's paying for it uh it also might look like drowsiness or slurred speech Smelling like they come to work smelling like a brewery or a distillery because it's still on them. It's still in their system and they didn't clean up. You know, it might look like a lack of concentration because they're not mentally fit for duty. 
uh, changes in mood, so emotional. So fitness for duty, I kind of define out as physical, mental, and emotional. Emotionally, uh, those with alcohol and drug issues, um, man, their moods change. Uh, they got bad grooming habits. They're not taking care of themselves. Bloodshot eyes, you know, th these are all fitness for duty type issues. Dilated pupils, might be some drastic weight change. Another big one is asking to borrow money. And I'm here mm -hmm. to tell you, man, mm -hmm. linemen and pipeliners make a whole lot of money. So if they're running through their money by Tuesday or Monday morning, you know that there's an issue. Wow. Um, and, you know, not, not dressing for the season. So it's freezing outside and they're wearing a T-shirt because their body is so hyped up. So their, their metabolism is so high that their body is actually hotter than normal. Or the other way around, it's hot outside and they're wearing a daggum hoodie, you know? Yep. And then lastly, avoiding people. Because unless if, unless you have a bunch of addicts together, uh, addiction works in isolation. So you avoid people unless you happen to have a conglomerate of, you got a group of addicts together. Yeah. So I think those are the biggest things you're looking for, Rod. Yep. And, you know, <clears throat> When you're saying that, I can remember um, years ago taking someone to a clinic, uh, a few different you know cases over my career, and on the way to the clinic, um, you know they're they're in pain, um, mm -hmm. and they're saying, you know, I, I just need to get me some get get some Vicodin and some Soma. If if they're, you know, uh, name branding, if they're telling yeah. you ahead of time what it is that they that they think they need or that they want or that's going to make them better that's a that's a big sign that there's something something else is going on there um, absolutely absolutely so, and sometimes you know we, we we often wonder how this stuff starts sometimes it's from a legitimate injury uh, yeah. my mom is the sweetest person ever or, or was we lost her a couple of years ago but she was the sweetest person ever. And even up until she died, but she had some back issues. She had some neck issues. And the, that's what the doctors prescribed. And over time, it just became such a part of her life yeah. that, that it took over yeah. until it didn't, until they cut it off. Yeah. And the, if, if you've never witnessed it or, or, I mean, maybe someone listening to this right now has actually been through this. Um, when you detox from an opioid, um, it is a horrible thing to witness. Um, you know, it, and the thing is, you know, with, with my ex-wife, for example, um, and believe it or not, that's the easy part, you know, getting off is easy. Staying off is what, what was hard. Absolutely. And, and so if, if there are people out there that's listening to this, um, reach out. Uh, you feel free to reach out to me, Jesse, anybody at, at the IP Institute or utility business media, uh, your, your supervisor, uh, a family member. Um, and, and the thing is, and, and I know this too, for a fact, is you're not going to stop there. They're not going to stop until they're ready. When, That's right. when, when that time comes. If, if I can be of assistance or any of us can be of assistance to, to help you through that, to help you, you know, because let's be honest, you know, some people, let's, let's just take me, for example. If I, um, you know, I, I have chronic back pain. Um, I, I, I get steroid shots from time to time. You know, I have the option of getting painkillers. I don't because of my past, uh, but let's say that, that I did. Let's say that I uh, you know, started taking them and, 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 you know, not even realizing it, I got addicted. Well, now I'm concerned, Jesse, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty high up in the chain of the safety department, man. I've worked hard to get here. I've been doing this for 30 years and what in the world am I going to do, man? I, yeah. you know, if I go to my HR department, what are they going to say? And so <clears throat> people may be thinking that kind of stuff, so if, if you don't want to go to your supervisor, you don't want to go to a family member, you don't want to go to your HR department, feel free to reach out to one of us. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, sometimes um, when you're in a position, like a safety sensitive position, like, you know, most of us, um, you're going to need to intervene. 
intervention is needed in order to uh, overcome this problem. <clears throat> so in, in that, this, and, and I love this next part of your article, where, where you talk about the profile of an addict. Now, th this kind of goes back to the signs and symptoms a little bit, but yeah. tell us about that, that right there. So this, man, this right here. So I want to keep this going with the safety guy for a second, because as safety professionals, I want you to think about what we deal with on a regular basis. We deal with the negative. We deal with the hard stuff. We deal with long hours. And oftentimes the way we cope is through alcohol, maybe some drugs. I don't know, but it's a slippery slope. And this next part, the profile of an addict, man, I wrote this with Justin Guerrero. He, he's uh, no longer with Supreme Industries. He's out on his own with another uh, electrical company now. He's, he's a, a manager, safety manager out there. But he and I wrote this. So I, I know about addiction. I come from a family of addiction. I dealt with alcoholism. I've dealt with, with other, I've dealt with addiction. And Justin and I, as I was writing this article and we were, we were, we were dealing with some stuff at, at the company we were working at. And he's like, I know what the problem is. I'm going to write this out because I've lived this. And he comes from being a lineman. He comes from, he's like a third, third generation lineman that became a safety guy. Mm -hmm. And what he wrote out, I'm just going to read this to you. You know, the theme of, of what the, of the profile of an addict and what they, they need to say, what they want to say, is this is the addict speaking. I've got bigger problems than worrying about this job. I'm fighting for my survival. And the addict profile states that up until now, so this is back to the profile speaking, I'm fighting for my survival. And up until now, I've been managing this problem reasonably well. As a matter of fact, until now, I haven't even considered it a problem. I've been able to make excuses to my boss when I show up late or call in sick. I've been able to make excuses to my wife when I get home late. And because I manage the money, the, my, my wife doesn't know that, that I didn't make a car payment this month. Working these long hours and staying out late to feed my addiction, it's been catching up with me. I'm not sure how much longer I can go on with this. But what I do know is that I'm not going to stop without help. And I'm not going to ask for help. Because asking for help means I have to tell the truth, beginning with telling it to myself. And telling the truth means that all my lies will be exposed, which means I'm going to have to face my guilt and shame. And I just can't do that today. Hmm. Maybe I'll do that tomorrow. Wow. That is the profile in the internal narrative of an addict. You know, as, as you were reading that, I, I kind of closed my eyes instead of looking at the screen and reading along with you. And I, I, I could hear, <clears throat> sorry, I get a little emotional about this one. This is truly yeah. a, a deep one for me. Um, I could hear the stuff you were saying there and I was relating it back to the people that I know and, and man, wow. I, I, I could see that um, over time in them. And, you know, that that's, you know, everybody says, and, and it is true that, you know, if, if you're an addict of alcohol, drugs, whatever it may be, it's a disease, right. And they, they, they call it a disease and, I'll be honest with you early on in my career and early on in my life, I had a hard freaking time accepting that, you know, look, just, just, just freaking stop. Okay. Stop, stop doing it. Stop drinking, stop doing this, that. And, and I'm specifically talking about my brother right now who mm -hmm. went through a, a very long time with alcohol and drugs. And, and it got to the point that, um, you know, we, we tried the interventions and there were rehabs and it was back and forth and back and forth and he would lose this job and he'd go to jail for that. And now he and I can talk about it. He's been clean now, I don't know, about eight years and, and he runs his own business and he takes care of his daughter and, you know, he's really got his life together right now. Um, and, and, and I believe he's finally overcome some of those demons. But to sit here and listen to you say that. Uh, I, you know, the, the shame that must come with it, you know, um, because come on, if you're doing this, you know, and, and you admit it to yourself and once you realize, Oh, I have a problem. That's not something you want to go, you know, uh, writing on the chalkboard. 
you know, letting yep. everybody know. So yeah, man, that's, that, that is awesome, dude. And uh, so, and, and now again, and I want to say this, this, this one more time, um, if anybody is listening to this or, or uh, you know, you know, now or, or later, just reach out to somebody, please. Um, you know, if you, if you want to report it to your supervisor, human resources, um, you know, please do. Um, and, and again, feel free to reach out to me, email, text, phone call, whatever. Um, if you just need somebody to talk to, uh, maybe somebody to bounce ideas off of, completely 100% judge free or judgment free. And, and, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm not going to tell anybody. So feel, feel free to reach out to any of us if you do need some help. Um, now the, the next couple parts of this, and, and, you know, when, when I used to be in the field, Jesse, I, you know, part of my job is to look around and see, you know, watch people, watch their actions, you know, do they look to be intoxicated? And you, know, you, you can usually tell, when someone like, like, like methamphetamines, when, when they're either mm-hmm. on them or coming down from them, you know, they, they have a certain uh, posture, a certain clicking noise that they make with their mouth and things like you can, you, yeah. you just kind of know, but let's talk about the legal requirements of this for a minute, because yeah, there's, there's the DOT stuff. And, and I know we're going to talk mm-hmm. about that, but, you know, as a supervisor, if, if I see someone doing these things, acting, you know, smelling like the brewery, you know, uh, acting like maybe they're intoxicated or still high, or maybe coming down from uh, a a weekend bench, you have a legal responsibility to report this. Okay. Um, And the management of your company, maybe it's you, maybe it's someone else, there, there are procedures and policies to deal with it, uh, and, and what I'm specifically talking about the reasonable, reasonable suspicion uh, part of your drug and alcohol policy. But you, you, you talk about the the CDL drivers in here, Jesse. Tell us about that. That's really not my my thing, but uh, tell us more about that. Well, you know, it, it's one of those things that CDL drivers uh, they're required to get trained on alcohol abuse. It's it's generally by an hour or at least it used to be five years ago. It may have changed since then. But drivers, especially for CDL drivers, they're required. It's mandatory that you you give them this training. And as far as supervisors, reasonable suspicion training uh, in general is uh, two to four hours, depending on kind of your training program. But as you're yeah, you brought something up. So if I'm a supervisor and I start to suspect something, Maybe somebody brought something to me. You know, somebody said, hey, Jim Bob over there is having some issues today. Why don't you go check it out to see what you think? If you've got reasonable suspicion, you smell marijuana in the vehicle, you smell alcohol, you notice that they're a little off, the the mental awareness, mental uh, level of consciousness is off. You got pinpoint pupils. There are many of them. And that's why we train supervisors what to look for. So if you're that supervisor, man, the first call you need to make is, or the first thing you need to do is make sure this person's not not in harm's way. So I'd probably pull them to the side and, and talk with them. Do your investigation. Try to see what's going on behind those eyeballs. And if you've got suspicion, make a call to the safety group and get them going. Make that call and find out what we need to do next because we do need to do some reasonable suspicion training. Now, functionally, the way I I always handled reasonable suspicion as a safety guy, because I'm the one that would show up in the field and Rod, you work too. I would generally treat it like I'm facing a medical issue, Uh, especially if it's suspected being drunk at work. I would I would treat it like it's it's a possible diabetic issue because okay. a lot of the symptoms are the same. You know, Jim, I'm 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 concerned about you. This is what I'm observing. Uh, you seem to have an altered level of consciousness. I kind of smell something on your breath, and and I'm concerned you might have a blood sugar problem going on. We're going to go get checked out at the local medical center, and we're also going to do a drug and alcohol test. This is called reasonable suspicion, but I want to get you checked out medically first to make sure you're okay. So that's the way I always approached it. And 90% of the time, 
it was not a medical issue, but that one time it was, or the two, two or three times over these almost 20 years that it was, it was so much worth it. And it does put them at ease as well, you know, mm -hmm. that you care about them personally. Yep, absolutely. Well, okay, so but before we close this out, I, I want to bring this up because this may be on uh, listeners' minds right now. Um, over the last few years, uh, marijuana, or specifically THC, has been legalized for medical and in some states recreational use as well. Um, so uh, there are states out there, and you guys already know them, Colorado, uh, California, and some others, that I, I can, you know, go into a bar and, you know, fire up a, a, a joint, you know, marijuana, or whether it's in liquid form or, you know, tobacco form or whatever, and it's perfectly legal. Um, yep. So, so how, 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 how does your company handle that, Jesse, where, uh, you know, you, you have employees in multiple states, some of them residents of, of states that it's perfectly legal to do this. Um, and, but they still show up to your job sites and try to and go to work. Well, you know, the issue here with, with drug testing for marijuana, uh, is, as most folks know, if you do a urinalysis, the current testing system, it's going to show up for generally about 30 days. So the stance, especially with with these states that it's it has become legal, either recreational or medical. And I believe we're heading to federal. I believe it's going to be legalized nationally here in the next five, definitely outside 10 years. Uh, I think the issue is, are they doing it at work? Are they under the influence at work? Kind of like alcohol. Mm -hmm. Now with alcohol, we got a good test. We can tell, we can give them a breath test. Uh, with the other Schedule One drugs, man, those stay in your system just a short amount of time anyway. But marijuana, those those are not legal. Uh, marijuana being legal, the question is, have you been doing it at work? Now, our current policy at the company is the same as it always has been, which is uh, we don't do pre-employment testing. But if you're in an incident, if you're in an incident or you have reasonable suspicion, we'll give you a drug and alcohol test. And then we deal with that. So Colorado or Florida with the medical, if you if you're test positive for marijuana, it's uh, it's dealt with uh, sometimes with a suspension, a first time suspension. And then generally we don't have issues after that. But I know some companies, they 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 tailor it per state. And, and I, I think that's, that's a good way to approach it too. I think there's, there's also just, uh, well, if you do federal work, if you're under DOT, uh, either oil and gas or pipelines, or, or you're a CDL driver, you know, that right there, it's still federally mandated, or it's still a federal mandate that you can't do it. So mm -hmm. that's kind of the way we've been dealing with it. Now, there are some tests that uh, you can do saliva tests. And supposedly, if uh, if it's been, it only tests for marijuana, it only catches marijuana within the past four to six hours of use, which would be in the workday. Yeah. So that that's an in, under the influence kind of thing. I question the validity of some. I, I've had some that I didn't think worked well, but uh, I believe that technology is going to improve. I don't know. Uh, Rod, how are y'all handling it? You know, um, ours is, like you said, is state by state. So we have offices uh, from the East Coast to, to the West Coast. And uh, specifically, we have three offices in California. And because it's legal there, if you are a resident of the state of California, and that's you're working out of those offices, uh, they don't even test for it when we do randoms mm -hmm. and new hires and that stuff. However, if you're a resident of Louisiana or South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, you know, the, uh, some of the other states we have offices in um, and we do a random or, or new hire, it's, it's tested for. So they're basically saying, OK, if, if I go visit California uh, and spend a week over there checking on the guys and stuff uh, and, you know, they go out that night and decide to, you know, hit, hit the pipe or. Uh, you know, do some some THC drops. 
that I'm not allowed to partake because I'm a resident of the state of Louisiana. That's where um, my office is located and that's where um, it's not legal yet. Um, and then we have another issue with the remote employees, uh, people that either are working a hybrid or they're working strictly from home. Yeah. Um, you know, what, what do you do when an employee uh, works remote? Um, and again, what, what we've done is we've gone back to your state of residency. If, if I am, hypothetically, I'm a state resident of the state of Louisiana right now, but I decide, you know, something happens and I'm going to start working remote and I'm going to move to Northern California. Um, but my residency still says Louisiana. I, I fall under the Louisiana drug and alcohol policy. So that's, that's the way we do it here. Um, so so let, let, I just want to recap real quick for everybody. Um, you know, <clears throat> drugs and alcohol uh, are absolutely a problem uh, across the country. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of times that problem um, bleeds into our job sites. And as safety professionals, um, it's, it's our responsibility, guys, to ensure the safety of our projects and the people on our projects. So if you haven't already, I would highly recommend getting some training in identifying and um, you know, understanding more about this topic. Um, but, you know, just being a coworker that cares, if even if that's all you are, you see someone that's struggling, maybe they come to work two or three days a week and you can tell they had a long night. Uh, I've worked numerous times with what we'd call a functional alcoholic. They would go leave. They wouldn't drink on the job, but they would go to their trailer or their hotel or their house at night. And just every night of their life, get just blitzed drunk and then go to sleep, get up the next day bright and early and they're back at work every day. But you could tell um, that, that it was affecting them. And if you see that, uh, be sure to say something, you know, you know, if again, it's not tattletaling, you know, address that person. And, and like Jesse was saying, you know, tell them that you're concerned. Yes. Uh, people that are addicts and know that they have a problem tend to get very defensive. Um, if that happens, just, just deal with it very carefully, but it's time it, when, when that time comes and you don't speak up, if something were to happen, um, I know I wouldn't want to live with myself knowing that. That's it, Rod. So, all right, Jesse, man, look, once again, buddy, thank you so much for being on the show with us. Um, you know, the Incident Prevention Institute, the IP Institute, and UBM for hosting and putting this on for us. Uh, if you guys, you know, ever have any questions or ideas for tailgate topics, please reach out and let us know. We're always looking for uh, people to write stuff for the, for the magazine. Uh, and one last time, if, if you are battling these demons, if you are uh, having issues with uh, any of this drugs and alcohol stuff, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, and, and Jesse, buddy, thank you so much again for taking time to do this with us. We really appreciate it, man. Hey, thank you much. And I'll see you all next time. All right, buddy. All right, guys. Thank you so much for listening. The views, information, and opinions expressed during this podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of Utility Business Media and its employees. It is strongly recommended that you discuss any actions or policy changes with your company management prior to implementation.